Now we have come to the final session of the conference. I would like to invite the speakers for session 8, Peace, Diversity and Inclusion. Please welcome on the stage Dr. Iqbal Ahna from Indonesia, who will speak on religion, violence and peace building. Dr. Ahmad Fauzi from Malaysia, who will speak on nonviolent extremism. Together with our chair for the session, Tunku Zain Al Abidin Ibn Tuan Kumuhris. Unfortunately, Dr. Mohsin Navki Nakvi will not be able to join the session as his visa application is unsuccessful. He has kindly provided us with his recording video. Professor Dr. Muhammad Hashim Kamali also will not be able to join as he is unwell. And our co-chair, Dina Zaman, unfortunately just tested positive for COVID. So let us pray for their speedy recovery. I will now pass the floor to Tung Kuzin. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to chair this session, which I think is a very nice combination of everything that we've been uh, speaking about in the last uh, couple of days because we've, you know, we've heard about democracy and civil society, economics, sharia, gender equity, um, free markets. And I think this, this session is more, um, this session is more uh, broad, isn't it? We're talking about uh, peace and inclusivity. And I think we can bring in the various strands of what has been discussed over the last few days, over the last two days, uh, towards the towards this broader theme of peace, diversity, and inclusion. Unfortunately, as we've just heard, there's been a rather slimmed down panel. Uh, so we will, I think, give our panelists more time to discuss, uh, to discuss things. And I want to um, sort of, you know, ideally we would have started with um, Dr. Muhsin Nakvi because it's, it's rather run, go straight into a particular country. We've talked about the Abrahamic faiths in general. Is there, there's no, there is a video, right? From, from him. There is. So I think, why don't we, shall we start with that? And then we'll go to the panelists who are, who are here today. And uh, I'll introduce the other speakers as they, as we come to that. So let's hear from Dr. Muhsin Nakvi first. Thank you. I wish to be there in Malaysia too <coughs> for uh, my presentation, but unfortunately I failed to get my visa due to some reasons. Anyhow, here at uh, uh, your service at disposal and I am ready to contribute to this noble cause of peace and harmony uh, in the world. As far as uh, my topic is concerned, uh, I would like to make some points. For different religions of the world. And what uh, concepts are uh, necessary, let's say, or important or a vital role in uh, creating harmony among the believers of uh, the world. Uh, I personally believe that we cannot bring 
religions together. You come to me, you cannot make all religions into one cause. Because uh, religions have their own uh, historical and social backgrounds, their own teachings. Again, related to their own circumstances in which they emerged and they developed. But what we can do is uh, we can bring people together, believers of people together on certain points, not compromising on uh, our own faiths, but for high, by highlighting in our world and psychology uh, certain concepts which can uh, harmonize the world religiously. <coughs> I would uh, like to uh, mention two uh, basic ideas like uh, which can play a vital role in bringing people of different faiths together. The one is uh, privacy of thought and the second one is privacy of uh, humankind. When I say privacy of uh, God, it means we go through the teachings of all the religions if we minutely uh, study the scriptures of different religions and uh, the teachings of their saints, their leading scholars and gurus. We come to know that every religion emphasizes on believing the God. God not uh, only as an entity which exists in the universe but a creator God who governs the universe. Though their names are different in different religions, uh, Bhagwan, Ishwar, uh, Allah, God, Yahweh, and uh, other names uh, which are very popular and common among the scholars that I, I think almost all the scholars, except scholar which is present here, you all people know the different uh, names <clears throat> and uh, we also know very well that every uh, name in, in, in every religion has its own perspective and in background behind that. Keeping in view uh, all those uh, concepts which are behind different names of God in different uh, religions. One thing is very clear that every believer, believer of religion, he concentrates on God and God's attributes and believes that God is the supreme being and a prime being in this universe and in this cosmos. He is governing, he is the creator God, he is governing the he is the sustainer of this universe. He is, uh, and God is uh, uh, a conception which uh, governs all the other minor conceptions related to religion and religious life. So, the mystery of God is common among all the religions and among all the believers. So, we can. Uh, Generate people on the primacy of God by using his importance in the universe and uh, <coughs> his attributes, which are almost common in every religion, major religions of the world. The second thing is that uh, uh, people also believe, the believers also believe that God is the creator of the Universe means everything which, is, which exists in the universe, including humankind, uh, including all genders. And I think there is no difference between uh, uh, the religions, religious thoughts, that uh, human being is uh, the most important creation of uh, God, Allah, Bhagwan, Ishwar. Uh, 
Uh, like uh, we uh, used to be in uh, the Bible, in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, when God created man in his image. In his image means uh, every human being, whether he is Jew or whether he is agnostic or atheist, is a human being. And being a human, he um, the, uh, he exists in the image of God. And from we read that uh, God said that I infused my rope, nafakto fi him, my rope into Adam. That means everyone, every human being who is uh, who live in this world or is living in this world or who will live on this earth it has a spirit of God in himself. And when we try to harm a human being, it means we harm the spirit of God which is embedded in him. Likewise, other scriptures of other religions also mention the primacy of man in the universe and uh, the strong notion that uh, the whole universe has been created by God for the service of human being is also very common among the religions. <clears throat> so human being is a primary importance. Animals are sacrificed for the food of animals, for the food of food human being, uh, this flora and uh, fauna, pastures, and every other thing, anything which is used as a food is the food of human being. And likewise, uh, man gets benefit, human being gets benefit from shining of the sun, shining of the moon and uh, wandering stars and this and that. So the universe has been created for serving the human being and the creator is God. So the primacy of God and primacy of human being are two mythic concepts which can be, which if honored by the human being and if embedded in the psychology uh, of human being and reflect uh, in their behavior and their character uh, can, the, the goal of the ideas can be a vital role, a very, very important role in bringing people of different faiths together. Therefore, uh, I would insist to pro propagate and promote the teachings of different religions with uh, reference to um, their scriptures. <coughs> which I have quoted in my uh, briefly with full references of the scriptures. Uh, I would not like to repeat it here because the presentation uh, would become uh, long uh, and we have very limited to, uh, uh, limited to uh, the time is very limited. If we insist on these two points with the help of the scriptures of the course of the scriptures of uh, different faiths and the teachings of uh, towering scholars and saints of you know, different faiths, we can bring people uh, together, at least the believers of the world together on these two notions, the primacy of God and the primacy of human being. Thank you very much for listening to my uh, few words. And this was the uh, this is this idea which I presented in my paper. And unfortunately, I am not there. And uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, the written form of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we, yes. 
applause for Dr. Mohsen Nagvi, who I should say, if you're not familiar with his biodata, he's an independent academic and scholar of Islamic studies based in Pakistan, but interestingly, holds a doctorate in biblical studies from uh, uh, NC, I presume that's North Carolina State University, Chapel Hill. And it's very interesting, his main research was on synoptic gospel. It's very interesting to see in the corner there. Um, that collection of different um, holy books, which is a very rare sight um, for, for us here in Malaysia. The idea that you could put a Quran up there with the Bible and Bhagavad Gita is not something that I think many uh, Muslim scholars here in Malaysia would approve of. So I think for that visual image alone, that was uh, most useful. Um, coming coming from, from that um, s sort of highlight of the sort of the... Um, the common grounds of Abrahamic faith that we just heard from Dr. Mohsen. I want to turn to you, uh, Dr. Iqbal, and to talk a little bit about you know, your, your view you, um, of this interplay between religion, violence, and peace building, in particular as it re relates to the concept of citizenship in Indonesia. I think for us here in Malaysia, we've always seen Indonesia as a very interesting case. Um, you know, we had our respective reformasi movements that, that, that altered our politics. And as you can see here, in the last few weeks and months, we've had a very highly charged political atmosphere where uh, the three R's of race, religion, and royalty are being weaponized. And indeed, when it comes to religion, very different ideas of what it means to be a Muslim. I mean, this has been going on for decades and decades, but has re sort of re reached its political zenith now in recent times. So very interested to hear, before I come back to a Malaysian perspective, what 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 is it? Look, what's the Indonesian perspective? Do you, do you want to sit up there, or? Yeah. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It is my honor to be uh, speaking here in front of the distinguished. Uh, professors and participants. So I'm the second speaker from Indonesia today and uh, some of the points that I would like to deliver today might be overlapped with the previous speaker, my colleague Dr. Boy Pradana, and so I might skip some of the slide. But uh, the title that I'm uh, speaking today is different from the title that is written in the in the module religion violence and peace building religion violence and peace, and peace building is actually my area of study uh, I'm, uh, I teach religion sociology of religions and uh, conflict transformation that's how, how I'm uh, I, uh, my degree from so uh, Muslim supremacism and the challenge to inclusive citizenship in Indonesia. By the term supremacism, I do not mean that uh, this is something that is related to our belief that uh, in Nadina, in the loyal Islam, that you know, uh, we believe that our religion, Islam, is uh, uh, you know the the best religions, the most correct religions, but. Supremacism has been something, an, uh, a phenomena, uh, political phenomena that we can find not only in Muslim community, but also in different contexts, including those with non-Muslim majority uh, countries. So, and this is uh, for me the challenge to inclusive citizenship, uh, liberty, and prosperity that we are facing now in Indonesia. Next slide, please. <coughs> Next slide, please. So let me, before I start my uh, point about the uh, situation in Indonesia, let us revisit our, our presumptions about religious freedom and prosperity. So I want to quote the finding of the research center, of the Pew Research Center here, uh, some of the presumptions, which I'm not sure how many of us believe in this. The innovation strength is more than twice as likely among countries with low religious restriction and hostilities. Presumed effect of freedom of religion and belief on prosperity. This is the finding of you know, a survey in many countries which found that 
when you have more freedom of religion and belief, you you have a country which reduce corruptions, more spaces, less harmful regulations, reduce liabilities, more diversities and growth. Some people might disagree with this because some people might think that uh, the more freedom you have, the more instability you have, and the more instability you have, then it is less difficult to develop the country. But I found some of the presumption that we have here is, uh, is relevant to the case of to the experience of Indonesia because, you know, the situations of religious freedoms in Indonesia, in my view, affects the ability of the government you know, to improve the economic, the prosperity condition of the country because of the burdens that, you know, uh, the government have to deal with, uh, with the issue of religious freedoms in Indonesia. Next slide, please. So, in the first day, we talk about the experience of some countries, and especially I would like to, you know, uh, recall uh, our, uh, our sister from Tunisia who talked about the political transition in Tunisia that led toward the, you know, uh, you know, the decline of democracy and uh, the increasing power of the state. And in Indonesia, I found something which is quite the opposite, even though it's not totally uh, contradictory. But uh, after 32 years, Indonesia, the, uh, under the authoritarian government of Suharto, in 1998, Indonesia embarked into a more open democracy. I mean, Suharto is democracy, but it's a different kind of democracy. After the fall of Suharto, the situation is completely changed because you have more space for the, for the civil society. So over 50 years of relative political instability, bloodless peaceful political transitions with recent trend of growing economy, uh, there is an uh, economic indicator of Indonesia such as that our growth is above 5%. But the GDP also is rising and control inflations. This is happening especially under this two term of President Joko Widodo, uh, which is ending uh, his, uh, his term uh, next year and he is now looking for a uh, successor because he cannot r run for the third time in the election. So, and he has some big projects in, in Indonesia now, and he's looking for the best candidate that will continue uh, his development projects in Indonesia. Even though uh, Joko Widodo has been accused by some Muslim group as anti-Islamic. However, it is also, Indonesia also see flourishing civil and uncivil society. That safe from, I want to uh, borrow uh, the, the term used by Jules Mikdal in his book, yeah? uh, strong state, weak society, to weak state, strong society. And this is, to some degree, what is happening in Indonesia no, with regard to, uh, you know, with the flourishing civil society in Indonesia. Indonesia is known for its, uh, for its civil society, but we have now more freedom and different kind of civil society are, are very active in Indonesia. Decentralizations lead to the rise of local political elites, many of which often exploited religious divisions and sectarian issues for electoral mobilizations. In some cases, local government consolidated power by allying with supremacist groups. The last few elections witnessed polarizing political climate and the relevance of Muslim supremacist rhetorics, especially during the Jakarta governor elections 2017 and 2019 presidential election in Indonesia. Supremacist Islamist politics has been you know, influential in the process of the democracy in Indonesia. Next slide, please. And I would like to share one of the examples of what I mean by supremacist politics. This is, uh, you know, uh, an interview that I held with one of the uh, for, with, with one, one of the leader of Majlis Mujahid in Indonesia, a prominent Islamist group in Indonesia associated often with Jemaah Islamia. And I did this interview about maybe like 15 years ago uh, for my master uh, thesis, and I was. I always remember this, uh, this quote, yeah? When I asked about why did some Muslim commit terrorism and violence, and he quote this, this verse, and I believe some of you memorized this verse from al Hajj 39 to 40. Permissions to fight or kital 
has given has been given to those who are being fought because they were wrong. And indeed, Allah is competent to give them victory. They are those who are who have been evicted from their home or driven out from their home only because they say La ilaha illallah, our Lord is God. So he referred to this verse to justify violence, to justify, uh, you know, extremism in Indonesia, including those committing suicide bombing in Indonesia. Because in his interpretation, the, the land of Allah, the land of Indonesia belongs to Allah. Its majority populations are Muslim. It should be governed by the law of Allah. When the government did not allow the laws of Allah to rule, it is as they affect Muslim from their land. They driven Muslim out of their home because they do not allow Muslim to implement Sharia. So that's the conditions to, you know, the conditions for violence because you, you believe that you are being driven out from your home because it is your home and you're not allowed to rule your home according to your law. So this is the rhetoric even though this is, I heard this rhetoric about 15 years ago, but this is repeated in many times, and which I believe is, you know, uh, resonating to many uh, audience of Muslim. So, some of the key narrative, which I think is now, you know, many Indonesians are dealing with, uh, and maybe, maybe not only in Indonesia, of the, uh, of the uh, supremacisms in Indonesia, that the, the belief that Muslims have been criminalized, and treated unjustly. Uh, the ulama is, uh, you know, brought to jail, etc. Uh, and uh, so, Muslim right to implement Sharia is guaranteed by Article 20, even though this is the Constitution, is guaranteed by uh, Article 29 of the Constitution, as majority of Muslims should have been, should have special right in Indonesia. So, the key of supremacism is the, you know, there should be differentiated citizenship for the majority, yeah. Sharia law protect minority, reduce crime, and promote prosper prosperity. Non-Muslim majority area might also make regulation based on their religious law. As we know that not, not all Muslim in Indonesia live as majority, but they, they, they demanded that because Indonesia is Muslim majority, so there should be some kind of privilege for the Muslim population in Indonesia over the other non-religious, non-Muslim populations. So Muslim exclusive citizenship for its unique role in independence. So they always claim that Indonesia got independent from the Dutch and it is Muslim who, who fought for the independence. And that's because of that, the privilege should be given to, to the Muslim. And this is the narrative, the supremacist narrative that justify, you know, hate and uh, persecutions, discriminations against minority groups in Indonesia. Even though for some this is normal, yeah, we, are, we live as majority, this kind of majoritarianism is normal, but for, from those who live as minority group, this is, this is uh, a serious issue. And I would like to share, this is the, uh, the picture that you can see on the slide, is the picture of the, the series of documentary film that we make. The, you can check in the website, the title of the series is IndonesianPluralities.org. So we have about uh, six uh, to seven, uh, documentary films on Islam in Indonesia, which we can be useful for your uh, educational purposes. So let me also mention some of the prominent uh, supremacist leaders in Indonesia, which uh, even though some of them are very vocal, some of them are very quiet, but you know, for me who is uh, observing this movement uh, for some period, even though sometimes they are quite active, sometimes they are quiet, but this has been a key force in mobilizing supremacism in Indonesia. The first is Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia. We know Hizbut Tahrir is an international political movement uh, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Bangladesh, in all Muslim majority country, even though they are not very big, yeah, but uh, uh, it is uh, disbanded uh, by the Indonesian government in 2017, but they are, their leaders are still free, so they are still very active in, uh, in, uh, in social media. That is Bakhtiar Nasir, and the third is uh, Rizik Siap. Bakhtiar Nasir was uh, the one who is leading the, the force for mobilizing the 212 movement that promote the Indonesia should not allow a non-Muslim to sit in the, in, in the government positions. 
So the government position should be an exclusive right of Muslim in Indonesia. So kafir should not be given a position in the government in Indonesia. So, uh, and this is the rhetoric that has been there and what I, this is the challenge for inclusive citizenship in Indonesia. The same, I think, uh, Rizik Sihab is more famous and he is, uh, sometimes he is more pragmatic, but he is uh, still a very, very influential figures among Muslims in Indonesia. And the last is a more mainstream Muslim preacher by the name of Abdul Somad. Even though he is mainstream, but he has been building this uh, close alliance with the more supremacist Muslim uh, organizations in Indonesia. <clears throat> so, just for a background, I mean, this is how I draw the map of, uh, you know, uh, Muslim religious landscape in Indonesia. You see, the the two, the two uh, biggest. Uh, circles are Nahdlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah, the two moderate Muslim civil society in Indonesia. You can see from the spectrum of the most violent and the least violent, the most committed to the system and the less committed to the political system. You can see here and you can see some smaller uh, Islamist group who are more violence or less violent or more committed to less committed to the political system in Indonesia, like democracy. Even though they often support candidate in elections, but they don't really believe in democracy. For them, democracy is uh, un-Islamic, so they're really looking for a way to, uh, to overthrow democracy. Ele uh, polit uh, in elections, this Islamist group has, been, has not been successful. But because they are not successful in the election, they look for a different way to translate their uh, their movement. So one of the way they do is uh, uh, by uh, most importantly by mobilizing at the at the level of the society by uh, street politics, uh, publishing in media, dawah and educations, as well as this is very what is very important is vigilantism against minority in Indonesia. So it's not only because they hate minority groups, but they use uh, negative sentiments against minority groups to to mobilize in society. And that's why we see now, uh, for example, some of the cases that are repeating in Indonesia. For example, the Shiite has been, in some places, has been persecuted in Indonesia. Some of them live in, in uh, what, in shelter for over 10 years without the ability to return to their, uh, their original village. The number of uh, the recurring trends of violence and discriminations against minority groups in Indonesia, and this is because of the ability of the supremacist group to build some kind of alliance with the local political elites and use that for some kind of uh, uh, political gain uh, in their uh, in their value uh, for translating their voices at the national political level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Iqbal, for that remarkable overview. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting information there about the, uh, the situation in Indonesia and what's been happening in the last few years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't introduce you earlier, but uh, you are assistant professor in sociology of religion at the Center for Religious and Cross-Cultural Studies at Gajah Muda uh, University. And uh, you, I read that you are the country coordinator of VDEM, which is an important project that we in Malaysia also participate in. Um, that was a very interesting graph when you had that, when you had those two axes of uh, most violent to least violent and commitment to the political system and not. And I wonder, um, Dr. Ahmad Fauzi, if, you know, if there is an equivalent graph for Malaysia. I think that's something that we would be very much interested to, to see. Uh, and of course, some of these characters, you, we see some of the same modalities, some of the individuals that you mentioned. We see some of the same processes, some of the same uh, attitudes, and some of the same uh, processes being applied here in Malaysia. But I'd like to hear from you, Dr. Ahmad Fazi, and to, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about um, non-violent extremism, right? So that space in the graph that we saw earlier uh, in the Malaysian context, yeah. Okay, uh, big thank you to uh, Tunku Zainabidin, okay, as the chair, and also like to thank uh, 
Mr. Ali Salman, okay, uh, from the Islam and Liberty Network, for giving me a chance to address this conference, and also for giving me the shortest title, I believe, for the uh, whole conference. It's just, it just, uh, my title just contains two words: non-violent extremism. That's all. Okay, if I were give, ever, if I were given the chance to add something. I'll probably add non-violent Islamist extremism, okay, since we are dealing with Islam and Islamism in this uh, conference. Okay, next, please. Okay, uh, on the left there, on, or on the right, rather, you see a very important book published earlier this year, uh, by, edited by Orofino and uh, Altron from the University of East Anglia and Leeds in the UK. My chapter is in there on Malaysia. This is one reference. Okay, and another important reference, which I published also uh, earlier this year, is a general article entitled Islamist Responses to the Taliban Takeover in Afghanistan, published in a journal called Politics, Religion, and Ideology. If you are an academy obsessed with journal rankings, this is a Q1 <laughs> web of science journal but, journal, but only academics will understand <laughs> what uh, I'm saying. Okay, now uh, some parts of this presentation are excerpted okay, uh, from those uh, two articles which I co-authored with my uh, former PhD uh, students. And these are basically the parts of uh, my paper, Defining Nonviolent Extremism, Imposing CVE, uh, Caveat, and the gist of this presentation will be CVE or CNVE. Okay, are we to counter violent extremism or countering nonviolent extremism? And a bit on my chapter on uh, ISMA, which is, which, is, which is contained in this book. Next, please. Okay, if you look at Islamism, basically the core idea of Islamism is that it's a political ideology rather than a religious faith per se. Uh, we can refer to uh, Basam Tibi's Islamism and Islam, for instance. So there are two core themes in Islamism, there, which is the Islamic State, not ISIS, but the concept of the Islamic State, okay, and the implementation of the Sharia. And then, uh, I also define extremism here, where extremism uh, conceives politics from a supremacist point of view, the one mentioned by uh, Dr. Iqbal just now, thus demarcating boundaries between in-group and out-group categories of people, uh, meaning uh, giving uh, Muslims or people of certain Muslim orientation uh, better uh, better uh, treatment, uh, better, uh, better status than others, and worse still if there's a takfiri attitude, okay? uh, the attitude which excommunicates other Muslims to the extent that uh, in the extreme situation, uh, Muslims who, are, who commit uh, murtad okay, or leave the region can be killed. Okay, when in power, extremists tend, tend to become intolerant and oppressive towards the other, this is another sociological concept where the other, the concept of uh, othering other uh, individuals or other groups who are, con who are not considered part of the uh, mainstream okay, or uh, the uh, definitive people of a particular country, state, etc. Next, please. So, if you look at Orofina and Orofino and Altron's uh, the introduction, you'll see that non-violent extremism, they also define as vocal extremism. It is extremism that comes out from, your, from one's mouth, orally, verbally. And why is non-violent extremism dangerous? In fact, I would say that it's even more dangerous than violent extremism. Why? Because it's non-violent. That's the very reason why it's more dangerous. But people don't seem to think that it's violent. So much so that if you look into the research done on extremism, it's wholly or mostly a great majority of the research is focused on the violent extremism. Hardly anything has been written on non-violent extremism until 
uh, this book uh, came out. So why is non-violent extremism dangerous? It's a conveyor belt to violent extremism. It is, it is called the slippery slope argument it, that it can encourage that particular person to commit violence later, perhaps not now. It encourages others to commit violent extremism, preachers, uh, for instance, who preach supremacist uh, ideologies, they themselves don't commit uh, violent extremism, but others do. Others who listen to their speeches, to their preachings, and uh, the other one is, is often overlooked by government's policy makers. Uh, show, so much so that some researchers, some researchers have written that non-violent extremism and violent extremism is actually two sides of the, of, two sides of the same coin. It's supremacist, Okay, it has uh, a lot of uh, problems conceptually, okay, but uh, one advocates violence, but one does not. Okay, so even uh, there's a quotation here from Orofino and Alton, what unifies extremism, both vocal and violent, is their rejection of pluralism. Uh, legal rules, the economic, political, religious, and social system they live with him. So it's a rejectionist uh, attitude, and this defines the attitude of both violent and non-violent extremists. And, and non-violent extremists, uh, are, sometimes we uh, disregard the attention to it just for the fact that they do not advocate violence. Okay? Next, please. And, and they, I think this research on non-violent extremism is very important in the case of Malaysia because if you look at this country in Malaysia, it, it, it's considered an anomaly. Uh, and and I, I wish uh, the degree of violence is very, very low, but the degree of extremism is uh, high. Okay, uh, there, there are some, some figures I'll show you later. And this I attribute to various uh, factors, for instance, the Sufi influence, uh, a high degree of acceptance of pluralism, so much so that the uh, right wing uh, parties from Gerakan uh, Tanah Air, I think, uh, led by Mahathir Mohamad in last elections, lost. Okay? And uh, th there's also high extremism but low terrorism. Okay? So I quote here from uh, Francis Lokowa. Uh, who's a, a well-known uh, political scientist in, in uh, Malaysia, already retired from USM, that Malaysia stands out as an aberration. Okay, in this article written in 2010, he uh, draws out a general picture of violence in Malaysia and how it has changed uh, throughout the years. And next, please. So this is a caveat that I'm not saying that violent extremism is not a threat. In fact, it's very dangerous. And I've spoken about violent extremism in many uh, occasions, in many gatherings. This is one of it, a webinar organized by University you know, Mr. Sarawak, where I was visiting professor. Next, please. Okay, uh, some reports in Malaysian uh, newspapers, uh, in The Star, uh, 2016, and then in Ipoh Eko, 2018. Next, please. Uh, in, in the star again, okay, there's uh, me over there, Chandra Muzaffar, Zamihan Mazin, and Ashraf Vajdi. Okay, Ashraf Vajdi was basically saying then, he was, he was, he was then Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, that there's, there's no uh, um, um, Salafi <laughs> influence in government administration. I was saying a, a different thing, uh, and this is based on my monograph on Salafization of Malaysian Islam. Next, please. Uh, in a Chinese newspaper, in, in, uh, um, in Malaysia. Next, please. Okay, if you look at this off-quoted uh, graph, you see the rates of extremism uh, based on support for ISIS in Malaysia is in number four. That means the extremist rate is very high, but the uh, instance of terrorism is very low. This is what I call anomaly. So the main problem of extremism in Malaysia is actually non-violent extremism, not violent extremism. Okay? In Malaysia is, in fact, the support for ISIS based on percentage of population is even higher than Indonesia. Despite we know that the occurrence, terrorist occurrences in Indonesia is much higher. Next, please. Okay, so peculiarity of Malaysian case, I argue that it has not given a due 
As a result, most research on uh, uh, extremism, terrorism in Malaysia focus on violent extremism. And now, we are having a problem in this country, which if you look at newspaper reports on the 25th August, an Abraham Prime Minister was Prime Minister also saying that we're having an extremist problem, a problem of extremism, which is largely non-violent extremism. And, and yet, where is the research which supports this? Hardly any. Okay, because people are focusing on violent extremism. But we are facing in this country non-violent extremism. Uh, uh, two articles as well. Next, please. Okay, so CVE or CNVE. I would say that we should have concentrated long time ago on CNVE, looking at how research has been developing in this country. But because of uh, problems associated, for instance, with global Islamophobia, and then with the uncritical acceptance of Western formula by local institutions and researchers who depend on grants from Western, mostly Western agencies, funding agencies and so on, who impose a particular agenda of CVE, countering violent extremism. So most research done in this country okay, has not actually attacked the uh, accurate goalposts. And I mentioned also here the disciplinary bias in favor of data-driven empirical political science methods. This led, has led to a securitization of this uh, terrorism or violent subject until mostly, most, most of them are political scientists, I would say. Okay? And uh, I would say that most of them neglect history, sociology, anthropology to the extent that now we get a very good uh, picture or research on extremism in this country. We have ne neglected research on non-violent extremism. Okay, and I, I would also say that I, I myself have uh, experience, okay, doing research on, uh, on extremism, but not finding any particular terrorist nodes and networks. And the funding agency refused to publish our results just because of that. So that's actually a neo-colonial aspect to this research done on uh, violent extremism and terrorism as well. As if the situation in Malaysia is the same as in other countries. But I would say that it's very much different. Okay, next please. Okay, so I would also refer you to this article written by Kevin Fernandez, whom I'm very, very proud of, PhD from USM, uh, and a non-Muslim academic who wrote this article in, in Swanabumi. Uh, this journal article, Swanabumi, is the Korean Journal of Southeast Asian Studies. Let me just read to you from his abstract. Local institutions and researchers in Malaysia may have assumed the Faustian bargain by agreeing with the Western narrative that Islam's teachings promote violence and extremism. They, that particular agenda imposing that I was mentioning just now. And what does he conclude? Uh, United States, through various institutions such as the Department of State, the University of Washington and others, had collaborated with institutions within key ministries in Malaysia to, decreate, to create, disseminate, and propagate narratives in support of the, the GWOT, Global War on Terror. So neo-colonial, neo-colonialism in, uh, in, in research on violence uh, and then terrorism. Next, please. Okay. So this is just a bit on uh, this, uh, my chapter in Arafun and, and Alton. Uh, I won't dwell on this because I'm uh, very short of time. Next, please. Next, okay. So just my conc concluding remarks. In confronting extremist challenge, developing and Muslim countries need to prioritize local indigenous resources, categories, themes, strategies, strength, narratives. Okay, unfortunately, I, I, I think that the situation in, in this country remains a lot to be desired, and most of the research done in this country is good towards a particular uh, conception which is favored by Western agencies, Western governments, or uh, Western funders. Governments, governments accept that U.S. is fumbling in Iraq and Afghanistan has rendered DWOT meaningless, especially after the mistakes committed, human rights mistakes mostly, in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Okay? And I would like to quote also from Asma Asfaruddin. Uh, this is from 2003. That means the quote is 20 years old. You can look at that uh, link where there's a dialogue between four uh, scholars 
and the Department of State. And what was Asma Asfaruddin saying? Our, i.e. USA's failure has been in not being able to reframe the terms of this discourse in terms that are meaningful to Muslims living in the Islamic world. And uh, uh, despite that, 20 years on, 20 years has passed, after Iraq, after, Afgan after, Afgan after Afghanistan, the situation remains basically the same. Next, please. Okay, that's all. Then, thank you. Thank you. Another, uh, another wonderful <laughs> update uh, from you, Dr. Fauzi. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes? 19 minutes. Okay, 19 minutes of discussion. Uh, and I hope to start formulating your questions. I think my first reaction to you, Dr. Fauzi, is what is, is um, nonviolent extremism normalized within our politics now? I would say so that it has, but not just for now, it for, for, for a long time, okay? for, for quite some time. And that has been the trend, if you see, for, for the past 10 years. In fact, I was saying just now in, in the, my, my quote just now from Loko Wah, he's saying that you look at the trend, that violence is not a trend in, in this country. And we should have taken a cue from that to conduct research based on nonviolent extremism. But then this agenda okay, uh, uh, came and a lot of things, unfortunately, were imposed to us. We also in need of money for money funds for research and so on. So we go along with the uh, with the patterns and trends imposed on us. And I was saying also how I mean uh, I was also encouraged uh, to pursue some research. But when there were conflicting uh, goals. Uh, Aims, uh, alas, the Western funding agency re refused to acknowledge even that. Let's see if we can get some other funding. I will come back to you, Dr. Iwell, but just one more thing. I mean, a lot of, a lot of um, research uh, has been done about countering violent extremism. What's the one thing that we can do in Malaysia to counter non-violent extremism? Yeah, I think the very first thing is for research institutions and also universities and to acknowledge that countering non-violent extremism is more important, more central, more pivotal, at least in this country, okay, uh, to, uh, in, as compared with uh, CVE, that perhaps if, if CVE, if it's conducted basically in Indonesia, we could understand, look at the level of violence there, if it's uh, conducted in, uh, for India, uh, for some societies in the Middle East, Iraq, and, 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 and so on, but since violence is not endemic, in uh, this country, and that has been, 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 been proven time and again by research. Okay? It, it, it is time that the government also takes, heats, uh, takes heed okay, of uh, the uh, voices okay, from uh, academ academia who are now, some like me, uh, we have to f search for our own funds to, to conduct okay, research uh, like this. Because most of the funds in this CVE, okay, uh, I mean CVE program uh, focuses on violent extremism and still do. Thank you very much for that. And how different is that prescription in the Indonesian context, Dr. Iqbal? Oh, you have a mic there. Oh, yeah, I totally agree with Dr. Aziz. I think uh, we need to pay more attention on nonviolent extremism in addition to our attention to uh, violent extremisms. And in the context of Indonesia, I think what is lacking now is uh, law enforcement against uh, violence against minority groups. And this has given some kind of impunity to this uh, supremacist group because when they, uh, you know, uh, when they attack and because of the pressure uh, from the, their, their mass and sometimes because of the issue of you know, defending minority groups sometimes is not very popular. And they, you know, they're running on that kind of sentiment. And, and this uh, impunity, uh, the inability of the police and the government to enforce laws against the violence give, uh, you know, some kind of confidence to, uh, you know, uh, to, the, to the radical milieu that help uh, uh, the nonviolent extremists in Indonesia.
Thank you. Indeed, a trend we see here. Lots of questions. Uh, Lord, Said Kamal. So I prefer, to, I prefer to hold it. Thank you very much for both those presentations. Um, what, I, I'm thinking about this in the UK context and also the US context where my parents live. And one of the things I've looked at when I've looked at this as a politician but also as an academic, but not published on this, I've written in newspapers but not academic journals on this, is the push and pull factors to people being radicalised. And I can see that non-violent extremism is one of the push factors to people engaged in uh, violent extremism. But there are also other pull factors. And have you looked at the pull factors, such as, for example, in the UK, there are people who may be second generation immigrants who are confused about their identity, or they have nothing to do after school, etc., etc., and the extremists come and um, uh, um, uh, recruit them. Or, for example, if they go to a masjid in the UK, but the khutbah is not given in English and they don't understand, and the extremists give them um, uh, material in English outside the masjids, so they, and that gives them their view of Islam. Have you looked at that in combination, so both the push and the pull factors? Thank you. Let's take the questions two at a time. Ira? Uh, Ira from Ideas. Um, I wanted to ask about how uh, democracy as a, as a system has a way of moderating extremist views, right? So I think what we're seeing in Malaysia right now with um, a very pro-Malay, pro-Islamic coalition in the opposition, uh, I feel like they are, they, there's no restraint on uh, the discourse and the uh, harmful rhetoric that they can say, whereas if they're in uh, government, then a lot of that is, is restricted, um, you know, because there's a need to appeal to the middle ground, um, whether you like it or not. So I'm just wondering if, uh, especially for non-violent uh, extremist groups, um, is, there, uh, is there a study or that, that shows, you know, perhaps if they move to being a political party and competing in elections and winning power, then that could moderate some of their views. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting. Thank you. Mustafa from Algeria, and Algeria is a Sufi country with Morocco and Tunisia, okay? Then my question is about what the role of Sufism in Tunisia and Malaysia have down, or because we didn't hear about the role of Sufi in this uh, problem, and uh, other things, what, what about education? How education is helping or not helping to promote no violent Islam? And I have to mention something, in Algeria, it is a Sufi group who have behind this, the initiative international by 16th of May. Each year, the, 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 all the nation, all nation celebrates the, uh, the international day of living together in peace. And it is promoted by Algeria, and it is Sufi group, and Sufi leaders who was behind. That means Sufi group have, uh, have a big role to, 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 to play in the global peace. Thank you very much. Okay. Can we take these questions and then, sorry to keep you waiting, but we will forget otherwise. Uh, Dr. Abel, do you want to take the question about the push and pull factors first that Said Kamal was talking about? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, uh, what is very influential in terms of the narrative among, uh, you know, these preachers, extremist preachers, in terms of pulling uh, young people or young generations into the extremist circle is the narrative of uh, the victimizations of Muslim. So the Muslim being victimized, Muslim being uh, criminalized everywhere. Of course, there are Muslims are, you know, having a terrible situations in Rohingya, have a terrible uh, situations in some places. But those who are suffering are not only Muslim, but also other minority groups also suffering the same. But you know, the sense of injustice can be real, but sometimes can also be perceived. So this perceived injustice against Muslims has been exploited. And, uh, you know, uh, just single uh, cases of, for example, uh, you know, how, for example, a company in, uh, in Sulawesi, because many of its labor are from China, and they accuse this, uh, this company as part of the entire Islamic communist mobilizations in Indonesia. And this kind of narrative, you know, for me is polluting Muslim mind. And this is the challenge for, for us. If we want Muslim to progress, how do we deal with this 
if I might say a virus <laughs> of thought uh, about uh, uh, the victimization of, of, of Muslim. So that's my response to that question, Simeon. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Fazi, two minutes on this idea of democratic participation as moderating some of this nonviolent extremists. Okay, thank you. I think is, that's very important, actually, the question of democracy and the acceptance of, I mean, democracy as a system where we, um, are modern Muslims, okay, living in uh, modern uh, polities, okay, whether you regard them as Islamic or not, it's a fate accompli for most of us. Okay, but for the extreme Salafis, okay, uh, I would say, look into some of their uh, discourses, and uh, interviews done my but done my colleague with Abu Bakr Bashir and so on is basically a nullification uh, and rejection of democracy, uh, pluralism, and all the uh, characters associated with a democratic party, which I mentioned just now. This is the big problem, and uh, the, the the problem become, becomes bigger when such narratives are accepted by uh, younger Muslims, especially through the influence of uh, social media and so on. Not really mainstream media, but uh, the uh, I mean, uh, social media. So with the government being pro-democratic, okay, uh, being basically a democratic government, I think it's very important, especially in, you mentioned nationhood just now, okay, uh, the, uh, the syllabus in schools and so on have to include Okay, and embrace concepts of modern statehood, which includes such, uh, such concepts as democratic constitutionalism. We see how difficult it is for this country okay, when we want to include the Ruku Negara. Okay, even in our um, in, uh, syllabus, it becomes so difficult. Uh, no, perhaps not, not uh, perhaps more even more difficult than the case of Pancasila in, in Indonesia, with even some uh, people who have been indoctrinated into thinking that liberal uh, mindset is not good. Yeah. That because liberalism is said to be against Islam. Yeah. The fact that there's, a, there's the word liberal in the preamble to, to the Ruku Negara now that that itself could explode into a polemic in this country, okay, which shows the level. Uh, I mean, the level of deterioration okay, of the uh, acceptance of these uh, democratic uh, concepts among our young, younger population. And I can see you've already half answered the third question. Can I come back to you, Dr. Eval? I mean, is, what is that role, you know, Dr. Fazi is talking about that role of civic education, right? Teach, teaching young Muslims about the institutions of the country uh, and making that reference to Ruku Negara and Panchasila. What about the wider point made by Mustafa about the role of Sufism? And also, I suppose, traditional institutions more generally. You had the massive bubble there of Nadatul Ulama there. And maybe a final word from you about the role of traditional institutions in Malaysia, such as um, the, the monarchies of Malaysia and their role in moderating this. Let me respond to the questions about the role of uh, ed education, especially Islamic educational institutions. I think uh, Indonesia has a lot of pesantren, and uh, most of these pesantren are based on the Sufi traditions, traditional Sufi traditions. But there has been change in Indonesia with the growing of you know uh, Salafi school uh, and also uh, a network of school associated with the associated with the Indonesian versions of the Muslim Brotherhood which is called Tarbiya. And these are quality good school and sometimes the traditional school are, uh, the traditional Sufi school are, uh, you know, uh, not very good in general science while the populations are now more aspiring to, you know, to get their children not only being pious as Muslim but also uh, uh, getting quality educations. While the Pesantrens only teach uh, students to be pious, not preparing them for the future in terms of uh, how they uh, access into uh, you know, uh, uh, good universities. And that's why a lot of parents, uh, even though they come from the traditionalist Muslim background, they send their children into this Salafi or Muslim Brotherhood school. And this is what is concerning, I think. Uh, 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 even though now there has been a pushback, you know, the traditionalist schools are, you know, Improving, uh, pesantrens are you know uh, uh, you know uh, reformulating their curriculums uh, to compete with this new aspiration from the parents, but they are just starting 
why this uh, more uh, you know Salafi and uh, Muslim Brotherhood types of school are already progressing earlier. So that's the problem, yeah. Yeah, if, if, if you Google me and look at some of my articles I've written quite at length about Sufism, Sufism in Malaysia, Sufism in Southeast Asia, all the good, the good things about it. Basically, my position on that is, 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 is clear, it's a plus. But this is not to deny that uh, Sufis are weak as well in certain respects, in the aspect of, for instance, embracing modern concepts of nationhood, uh, modern concepts of uh, citizenship, and, and so on. And, and I, I would say that, uh, I mean, Anwar Ibrahim, the Prime Minister, realises this. He's been gravitating more towards the Sufis uh, since he became Prime Minister. And even before that, okay, uh, uh, when Bakhtan Harpan by embracing Abdullah bin Baya, who's a modern-oriented Sufi, okay, uh, with a concept such as Muwatana, citizenship, which, which accepts the non-Muslims as, as uh, citizens of a particular, of, a, of, an, of an Islamic polity and so on without any problem, I think this is, uh, this is uh, more positive okay? in, 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 in terms of the um, application of a modern concept of Sufism. Okay, um, we have five minutes. Can we take all the questions together, 30 seconds each, and okay. then we'll let the panelists pick and choose which ones they want to answer. Sure. Okay, uh, my name is Imran from Malaysia. Um, while we talk, uh, we use the term of uh, vocal extremism, in my field, uh, media information literacy, we call it as hate speech or dangerous speech. And um, I monitor hate speech in Malaysia at least for the past two elections. And uh, we understand that the younger generation is not right now is very much uh, influenced by something they have, never, they have never experienced, for example, like May 30, 1969. So, um, just a question to Dr. Mafauzi. Um, this trend that we see, do you see that it's going to go to the scale where we will see physical or violent extremism happening in Malaysia? Or, and for you, Dr. Iqbal, do you see the downward trend as you see the progress that you see in the present trend and blah? Do you see the, the potential of that trend going down in Indonesia? Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Uh, my queries have sort of been whittled down as I come down the line, so that's good. So, um, uh, with the last gentleman, he's working on hate speech. I think part of the problem of not getting funding is sometimes uh, we have not uh, caught on with the catchwords that maybe the international organizations like the UN is doing. For instance, uh, Antonio Guterres has actually supported the UN framework uh, on hate speech. Um, and how hate speech may lead to a crime of atrocity which could amount to genocide. So, for instance, uh, Dr. Ibal has mentioned how extremist uh, Muslims in Indonesia have used the uh, examples of uh, Muslims, in, minority Muslims, maybe I'm sure it's Palestine, for instance, and how uh, the, the, this rhetoric has been used to create uh, non-violent extremism. But the concern um, that uh, the UN may have, and I say this because I had a three-month stint uh, in New York as a political officer for them, is hate speech will lead to atrocity crimes. And this has been used, this has happened in other countries, not necessarily in Muslim context, as close as the southern border provinces of Thailand. Uh, they do not know. They have atrocity crimes, but they... they have not linked it to the existence of hate speech and they cannot link where the hate speech is coming from. Is it coming from the state? Because they have a history of seeking independence but they were caught in the rhetoric of the global war on terror and that has been used perhaps both by the Thai state and the Buddhist extremists to actually create violence in the South. That's just my uh, contribution, but I really would like to uh, assist if I can because I have come from the uh, UN and I may know how to figure out some of the, uh, you know, the words we can use to capture funding. Thank you. Thank you. Is that for it, Prof? Thank you. Um, okay, two points um, on nonviolent extrem extremism. Um, would you agree that part of the encouragement to nonviolent extremism is because the state itself promotes it. Uh, many governments, many Malaysian governments, 
certainly the Najib government, um, and it continues today to some extent um, in, in, in terms of um, what comes you know, out from um, religious leaders, fatwas, uh, um, uh, khutbas in uh, Friday sermon. Uh, but I'm talking about kind of uh, hate speech against Shiism, against feminism, against liberalism, and, and so on, right? So um, that would, would that not partly explain why um, uh, non-violent extremism receives less uh, support in terms of research and so on? And the other issue is this. Would you agree that it's more appropriate to refer to this as non-physically violent extremism rather than just non-violent extremism? Because I think it's possible to make the case that uh, what you're calling non-violent extremism is extremism, but it is, uh, it, it is extremism, but it is also violent, but not physically violent. And the analogy, I'm, I'm drawing the analogy from women's studies, where it is established, it's quite well, well accepted, that um, abuse against uh, wives, for example, spousal abuse, may be psychological rather than physical. You know, demeaning uh, speech, um, such as you know, the husband telling the wife that you are useless, uh, etc., etc. When uh, when uh, extremist Salafi says, you know, that um, you will go to hell, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, maybe it's important to stress that these extremist views are violent, but in a psychological sense. Hence, the term non-physical uh, violent extremism. Your thoughts. Uh, thank you. Um, echoing a little bit on uh, what uh, Dr. Alata said, uh, it's fully understood of the uh, the focus on on Islam and on Muslim sources for potential extremism and violence. But what mechanisms are in place to deal with those who draw their inspiration and encouragement for violence and extremism based on Western democracies, uh, which haven't exactly had a track record of of peace? Uh, particularly exacted on, on the Muslim world. I mean, the, the idea that they could draw then uh, the ideas of, uh, of violence from seeing a society like my own in the United States or in Great Britain or elsewhere and the way that they operationalize and weaponize democracy uh, uh, around the world. I was wondering how that might change your focus in how to deal with this issue. Thank you. Okay, I invite the panelists to have two minutes each on all of those questions, please. So sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry I, if I uh, cannot respond to all the questions, but I would like to respond on the issue of his speech and especially reflect this on the context of Indonesia. And um, yeah, in, in the context of Indonesia, there are the laws uh, are uh, ambiguous, yeah, but uh, there are there are components of the law that are related to speech. The laws uh, that regulate the so-called blasphemy. And then the laws that regulate uh, agitations for violence. And unfortunately, what is most frequently used is the law against blasphemy. To protect religion, not to protect those who are uh, targeted by hate speech. But, you know, the protecting, you know, for example, uh, uh, but blasphemy is not that you, you say something bad about religion, but often blasphemy in the context of the law in Indonesia is more about, you know, you know propagating unorthodox teachings on religions. So that's, that's what is understood as blasphemy in Indonesia. So for example, suggesting if you, you, you preach and you say that, uh, you know, you don't have to go to Hajj, to Mecca for Hajj, you just have to, you can go for Hajj in the mountain next to our village, for example. That's unorthodox. And that can be, uh, you know, uh, subject for a blasphemy law in Indonesia. And unfortunately, this is mo most frequently used rather than the, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the hate rhetoric that has been propagated by the extremist, uh, extremist leaders. And I think uh, this is the issue that we in Muslim world, I think, should deal with. I think this is not unique experience of Indonesia and how do we deal with hate speech and blasphemy and i think this is a this require a, a one seminar to discuss this topic thank you very much everyone for your questions okay i think the question of the state that was uh, raised by professor latas 
okay, uh, by uh, several people, several of my colleagues just now. I think that answers the uh, several questions at, 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 at one stroke. This is one of the main problems and one of the main obstacles uh, when we think that this problem of non-violent extremism will cool down in a moment, okay, and uh, in, 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 in no time, I mean. And if you look into the composition of even the present Malaysian government, they are former, because it's a, it's a coalition between former enemies, between Pakatan Harpan, between AMNO, and so on. There are members who, were, who, when they were enemies, were accusing the others. If we look into the question of non extremism uh, hate speech, that would probably be it. Some, uh, you can easily Google and look at some of the statements by former ministers now who are saying nasty things about Mama Sabu, because Mama Sabu, which is today also a minister, was accused of being a Shia. This was, say, 10 years ago, but now they are in the same cabinet. Both are ministers. So, they, <laughs> uh, and these things, unfortunately, are maybe ephemeral. If uh, Amno one day finds itself getting back in the opposition, so on, these things uh, might change. So I, I think it's a, it's a big problem with uh, politicians, okay, uh, not really uh, looking at academic uh, matters, okay, as it should be looked at, but, but rather, uh, I mean, but rather use them or manipulate them for particular political purposes, and, and especially to this to advantage or disadvantage, okay, uh, particular view. Okay, which um, which is uh, consonant with their own political uh, political inclination. I think this is one of the big problems that you mentioned about the state just now. And on the question of uh, whether we should call it non-physically violent extremism, I have no problem with that. Only that then another sort of new discourse should be uh, put in. It's just because that is the popular. Uh, term uh, when, when when things are mentioned now as non-violent extremism, for instance, the book that's published earlier this year, then it's physically it's basically understood that it means non-physically violent. Uh, we understand that there's also psychological violence, okay, violence against women, against uh, I mean uh, minority groups, against uh, Ahmadis, against Shias, and so on. We we of course of course we accept that as well. Thank you. I think uh, there's nothing for me to add. I just want to thank both panelists for doing sterling work and carrying the weight of uh, two other people as well who were not present. Um, let's give them a round of applause. And I think we, we end this uh, session on a very high note. I pass it back to the MC. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yang Ahmad Mulia, Tunku Zain, and all our esteemed speakers for such a fruitful discussion. Kindly remain on the stage. Now, I would like to welcome a young Mamulet to Kuzain to deliver the token of appreciation. Thank you very much.